Well, look, I, thank you for coming out. I, I've given talks at, at several different trio groups. I, I lived in New Orleans for a while, and I've been in New York for a while now, and I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and I've been actually, I've probably given a dozen talks to trio groups, and they always have the same themes. Uh, they're very real people who really identify. You all introduce yourself by what organ you are, uh, which has always fascinated me. It makes sense you're at a talk with a transplant group, but I have no idea what any of you do, but it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, <laughs> what, what bonds you together is, is this thing called transplant, which really is a, a, a gift. Um, so appropriately, we're here at the gift of life. So, um, you know, and feel free to stop me anytime. Uh, this is uh, a talk about um, the harsh reality of not having enough organs and why, at least for uh, liver and kidney transplantation, we feel justified doing living donation. We don't do that um, for heart, at least it's not done legally in the world, maybe in, in China, um, but it's not exactly living donation. It's just uh, unconsented deceased. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's not even domino for heart, but it's uh, executing people in the Falun Gong in China. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, yeah, well, then you really are quite educated because that most people have never met any of those people. Um, so, you know, this talk could also be entitled, Why Do We Need Living Donation at All? Um, but since we're going to talk about a harsh reality, John, I'm glad you showed up with your hat because wouldn't be right if I gave the talk and didn't talk about the harshest reality. <laughs> uh, and yes, he had the greatest season ever of all time. And yes, the kid is cute, but let us not forget tonight that he wasn't the first guy to bring his kid to the Super Bowl. Um, that would be the Drew Brees. I'm a diehard Saints fan, but all right. They had a great season. We got that out of the way. I was going to leave that to later, but I couldn't resist. Uh, you know, so what is the, the problem? Um, and we're going to talk a bit about that. We're going to talk a bit about some of the solutions to the problem. And then I'm a surgeon, so you know, it's obligatory. We have to talk a little bit about some of the cool things we do surgically. And then maybe a little bit about more societal-wise what our responsibility is. Um, so the problem, this is, if you've been involved in transplant, you've seen this. Um, it's, it's not been updated in a little while, but the story continues. Um, I, I think now there are 115 or 116,000 people waiting for an organ transplant. The vast majority are waiting for a kidney, over 95,000. But uh, you can see here that even though the number of transplants goes up and the number of donors goes up, it, it pales in comparison to what's happening to the need. And, and part of that is the success of transplant. As we've done better and the results are better, the uh, indications have expanded and more people want it. Um, so if you look, and this is now you know, really up-to-date data, this is hot off the press, you know, the, the most recent you can get from, from 2016 is that uh, we put 35,000 people on the waiting list in 2016 for a kidney and 12,000 on the waiting list for a, a liver. You know, just in those two organs alone, that's 50, over 54,000 people added to the list, but we only transplanted 32,000. Um, now, sure, some people fall off the list, but the net effect is that the list keeps growing and growing and growing. And, and, and the reality is that there aren't enough organs for all these people. So somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 6 to 10 percent of the list, depending on which organ, dies without ever having the opportunity for transplant. And for some of the organs, like, like heart, um, it, the percentage is even higher. How are you? Um, and, and for some of the organs, like kidney, where there is you know, dialysis, maybe it's not quite as high, but it's, it's still very real. So just a little bit of a reminder and maybe a refresher, for, you know, for those of you who've had a kidney transplant, you'll know quite well, but um, for those of you who haven't, uh, and, and this, a lot of this can be applied to um, any of the organs, but uh, at least for kidney transplant, you know, 40% of the people who end up on the waiting list for a kidney transplant die on the list waiting, which is really a remarkable number. And we know that people who get a transplant off the waiting list have a 60% lower chance of dying compared to those people who wait on the list. And the results for transplant are, can be completely correlated with the time people spend on dialysis. If you spend a long time on dialysis, your chances of doing well with a transplant are not good. And if you look on the left, you can see that the, the rate, this is the rate of end-stage renal disease in the population. The, all you need to know is that over the years, the line just goes straight up. And part of that is because as the baby boomers reach the age where things like diabetes and high blood pressure catch up to you, uh, your chances of having kidney failure catch up to you. And then the bottom in the green graph is the transplant years per 100 patient years, which 
that's a fancy way of saying we're not doing as many transplants as, as we have in the past because there are way more people who need it and way more people waiting. And then if you look on the right is a map in the United States that it, it color codes the weight for transplant. The weight in places like California uh, and New York for a kidney can be upwards of 10 years depending on your blood type. In places like Florida can be two years. I mean the weight is real and it's a long time to be sitting on, on the machine. Um, kidney transplant also saves money, not for nothing. Uh, and, and this is just staggering data, just to kind of put in perspective. You could, you could look at any of the organs and, and see similar staggering numbers, but kidney is really amazing. In 2006, 6% of the entire Medicare budget, or $22 billion, was spent on the care of the half a million or so people with kidney failure. And of that $22 billion, almost $2 billion was spent on the 150,000 who got a kidney or had a functioning kidney for their medicines, at least for three years while the government would pay for the medicine. And that's the amount of money that was spent by the dialysis units on erythropoietin. So it really is not a huge amount of money that we're spending on transplant, but we're spending this inordinate amount of money on the care of patients with kidney failure. And if you look, the, the most recent data you can get from the government is now you know, almost eight years old, but it's from 2010. In 2010, over 35,000 people were listed for a kidney. There were a little under 12,000 transplants done. About 525,000 people were treated for kidney disease. That was $40 billion. In four years, the government went from spending $22 billion on end-stage renal disease to spending $40 billion. It's, it's, it's probably closer to $60 billion today. Uh, I mean, it's just a remarkable amount of money. And if you look at dialysis, dialysis costs about $70,000 a year. The immunosuppression, the drugs, cost about $15,000 a year. And these studies have been done already. It, we know that if people get a, tr a kidney transplant, there's an estimated $300,000 lifetime benefit per patient. Uh, and that's money that the government's paying for. So we're all paying for all these people to have dialysis and sit on the machine when there's a, there's a solution. We can actually, the government could make a lot of money by having more people get transplanted. We could have a lot more money to spend on, on other things. Um, so if you want to sum up kidney transplantation, um, clearly it improves the quality of your life. You can eat and drink what you want. You don't have to go to dialysis four hours a session, three days a week. Uh, it's, it, it's not so easy to be on dialysis. It improves your lifespan. You're going to have a, 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 sh a lower risk of having a heart attack or, or a stroke, which are dramatically increased if you're on dialysis. And it improves the burden on society. It's clearly cost effective. And most people, if they, if they wanted to, could return back to work and to productivity. Of course, in our current system, the government only pays for immunosuppression for three years. Uh, and then you know, you know exactly what's going to happen. People do well for three years, and then in a lot of communities, the government stops paying and they end up back on dialysis and we do a more expensive second transplant. So it's really a, a, a cycle we need to stop. Um, the question is, how can we get more people to, to transplant for any of the organs, but uh, in this case for kidney transplant, how do we do more? Well, in order to understand that, and this would go for, for all of the organs that you've all had, uh, where do these organs in general come from? They, they come from people who are brain dead. The problem is there's no book that says brain death for dummies. Um, brain death is a very complicated issue, and it's not, a, uh, uh, it's not by chance that in the 1960s we first nationally started having the discussions about what is brain death. It's not a coincidence that it was also in 1962 was the first deceased donor kidney transplant in the United States. In 1967 was the, the first liver transplant and the first heart transplant were done in the United States. So it was right around that same time <coughs> that medically we could offer things like this that we needed to start to have national discussions about defining brain death. For those interested in, in the history of this, I mean, it's a fascinating read if you want to read about uh, how brain death is determined. There's the Harvard Committee on Irreversible Coma that was in the late 60s and in the early 70s. And ultimately, a, an act was passed by Congress, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, which is essentially opt-in, which means um, you have to uh, say you want to be a donor. It, ex it explicitly gives an individual the right to designate before you die if you want your organs to be donated. Or if you didn't designate, it gives your, your next of kin the right to say, oh, you have more guests or just people passing by? Uh, okay. Um, and then ultimately in the 80s, 50 states adopted the Uniform Determinant of Death Act, which is what established brain death and the ability to take people and, and have their organs donated. 
1984, um, then uh, young Al Gore, uh, a, a junior up on Capitol Hill, um, was actually introduced to the National Organ Transplant Act, or NODA. This established UNOS, um, which has the contract from the government to oversee transplantation, um, established a framework for how the organs would be distributed, and it also mandated the formation of nonprofit OPOs, like this building. Um, and defined what a transplant center is and oversees the activities of all transplant programs. It also made it a federal crime for any person to not only acquire, receive, or otherwise transfer any human organ for valuable consideration, and the language was important. Um, this was put in place for uh, a specific reason. At that time, in the mid-80s, there was a private company that wanted to do for-profit organ procurements and sell the organs to the hospitals. So uh, even Gore, in his comments about how NODA came about, said, we put this in valuable consideration because we wanted to thwart those efforts of somebody to commercialize this. But all of the authors of this felt like, you know, there might be a role to actually compensate people in one way or another for their organs. But since 1984, that's actually a, a federal crime. So how, how can we work through this? How can we get more organs? It, it's not so simple. If it was simple, we wouldn't have so many people waiting. And a lot of this is related to myths, misconceptions, and of course, the media, this is way before fake news, although some of this is fake news. Um, you know, there's this common perception that they'll take my organs out before I'm dead, so I don't want to donate. I mean, the reality is that the doctors who take care of people when they've had strokes or accidents are not the same doctors who are involved in transplant. And the transplant teams and the OPOs, they don't get involved until those doctors say that, that it's, it's enough and the family agrees that the, or the people are declared brain dead. It's impossible to have a regular funeral service after an organization. Simply not true. People can have open casket. And the transplant community and the OPOs are very conscientious of this and the, 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 the gift that people are giving and, and the respect that, that the bodies need to have. Um, only famous people get transplanted. This was really perpetuated by Mickey Mantle and, and, a, and a bit of a, a scandal um, in Texas at the time. And in the transplant community, people get drummed out for any of those types of behaviors today. Um, there's really no you know, buying, uh, you know, paying for the library and moving up to the top of the list. It's, it's not like what you watch on Grey's Anatomy or on TV. Um, there really is a system and it, it, it's, it's taken very seriously any infractions of that system. To be an organ donor, you only need to sign your driver's license. Unfortunately, that one's not true either um, for a variety of reasons. First of all, the whole idea of signing your driver's license probably sounded like a really good idea at the time, but if you had a product and you wanted to go sell it, would you really entrust that to the people at the DMV to be your, your marketing team? No. Um, and, and even if you sign the back of your license, uh, we could go to court and get a declaration and, and do it, but you know, you'd go on the, the family would go on the corner and call CNN and scream there, take, he didn't mean it. You know? So it really has to be an understanding. Signing the back of your driver's license is more about creating an understanding with the people who will make those decisions. God forbid um, you, your, your demise comes and you can be an organ donor. But it, these are important things and important conversations to have. So like going out to high schools is, is a really great way. It's not because we want bad things to happen to other people. We want to be realistic and we want people to have these discussions before the time comes, which is, is not common. Um, but you, you can certainly um, be an organ donor without signing your, your driver's license. Organ donation costs money. Um, it doesn't cost, it does cost money, but it doesn't cost the families any money. Um, anytime somebody's declared an organ donor and, the, and all the tests that are done, even if the person never donates, that's all assumed by gift of life and, and the equivalents around the country. Uh, and there's a mechanism for that through CMS and through a cost reporting structure. Um, donation is against my religion is one that I have to deal with quite frequently because in New York, it's a great melting pot, particularly of religions. And um, this just simply isn't accurate. And, and the, the biggest religions in the world, the, the Quran, saving a human life is likened to saving a whole nation. The, the Talmud says that whoever saves a single soul, the scripture ascribes merit to him as if he had preserved a complete world. And the Pope, has said that organ donation is a noble and meritorious act and is to be encouraged as an expression of generous solidarity. And in fact, essentially every major religion in the world has approved of organ donation. The only exception to that, if you consider it a religion at all, are gypsies don't actually um, approve of organ donation, but they're not really exactly organized. But short of that, everybody else's religious leaders have, have, have agreed with this.
um, including Jehovah's Witness, and, um, but that's a, co a very common misconception. So what are, what are some of the things that we can do for, for deceased do donation? How can we increase the number of donors? How can we get more organs? Um, really, there's two things that I, I think that are, are, are potential. Uh, one is something called presumed consent. And some of you may know what that is, but presumed consent is where we just assume that everybody's an organ donor. That's as opposed to what we have in the United States, which is informed consent, where you have to agree to be a donor or your, your family has to agree for you to be a donor. And if you look in the world and you look at the countries that have presumed versus informed consent, you actually see some fascinating things. I don't know if this has a pointer on there. Is there a point? Well, um, all the way on the left is Spain, which we know has the highest donation rates in the world, upwards of 40 per million people. And the, the, the access is um, donors per million population. Um, they're now up to 40, which is, is an enormous number. The United States is about five over, and we have somewhere between 20 and 25 donors per million population. Um, way less than Spain, but actually not that bad. There are a lot of countries in the world with presumed consent that don't do very well. And, and people have a lot of questions about, could this work in the United States? Uh, there are some really important lessons to learn from the Spanish model. So first of all, they, they decided in 1979 to establish presumed consent. And they have something called the National Organizations of Transplants, which is kind of like our equivalent of, of a UNOS. And in 1988, they were only doing 5,000 transplants in the, in the country of Spain. In, by 2006, they were doing 62,000. Today, that number is somewhere around 80,000 transplants. I mean, a dramatic increase in the number. These are deceased donor transplants. How did they increase their transplants so dramatically? Um, and if you look at Spain, it has less than 1% of the world's population, but it accounted for over 6% of the world's liver transplants. I mean, it's, it's really a remarkable country. And interestingly, the refusal rate of 55%, it went down to 15% by 2006. So nobody, and today their opt-out rate, um, if you want to opt out in Spain, you have to write and say, I don't want to be a donor, as opposed to here we have to say, I do want to be a donor, is really quite small. It's just a couple percent of people who write, I don't want to be a donor. And so they call it the Spanish miracle. Um, really, it's Spanish practicality. And if you really take a deep dive into the system, there's, there's a lot to learn. First of all, in Spain, they have a true countrywide dedicated effort to increasing organ procurement. And, and actually, I, honestly, I think Gift of Life is one of the best performing OPOs in the country. And probably it's not so far off from what they do in Spain. It's just a, a real dedication to making sure this works, a fine-tuned system that maximizes the detention, detection of, of potential donors. And they have a mechanism of consent that's um, it's really seen by people as more about the ethical and moral responsibility that somebody living in Spain has than it is by, about signing any driver's license or anything like that. And it's all hospital-based. They have a network of hospital coordinators. The government pays for this. They have doctors who are trained and committed to all the different strategies and how to get organ donors, how to you know, try to take care of the people so that they're trying to save their lives, but when it's clear that they can't, are very rapidly moving them into the position where they could be organ donors. And if you look at the sociology in Spain and the dynamics of family consent, first of all, they guarantee that nobody in the family is alienated. So even though they have presumed consent, even though the people are assumed to be donors, they still call every single family and ask their permission, um, which they don't actually legally have to do, but it, it engenders people, encourages them to be a part of it. And they never pressure the family to consent. And in the rare instance that somebody doesn't, they don't move ahead. And they, they, but most people in Spain actually feel a moral conviction to do it. And, and this is interesting. I thought this was probably one of the secrets to it. This 99%, you know, 100%, essentially everybody, regardless of citizenship, has access to health care. So in Spain, they just take care of people. And I think when people die and potentially become organ donors, even though they're presumed to be organ donors, the families and the community want them to be organ donors. And that's not necessarily what we see in the United States. Of course, we don't take care of everybody uh, with health care, and it's probably one of the underlying reasons why organ donation is not as good as it can be. I include this because that's just a really cool thing. I have no idea what that means. I don't do math very well. But this is what I can tell you, that um, it's been looked at in the United States. What would it mean if we did presume consent here? What, what do we think would happen? And there were two big studies. 
one in 2006, and I think the other one was in 2010. But we, it was calculated there would be a 25 to 30 percent increase in deceased donors in the United States. And, and if you looked, with presumed consent for kidneys, it should go from 13 or 14 per million to 23 per million. That's a pretty dramatic increase. Um, the problems are, how do we put that in place, and will Americans really buy into this? You know, we don't particularly like to be told what to do. Uh, we don't mind doing it if we get the choice, but um, there's a real question about what the societal perception would be if we had presumed consent in the United States. So there's been attempts at legislation for this, and they've fallen short. And one of the biggest pitfalls of it is that it's pretty well described that if we implemented presumed consent, we would probably also see a reduction in living donors, particularly for kidney, which would go down from about six per million donors down in half to, to less than three. So if we were to put this in place, we would probably have to accept it would be a disincentive to people to be living donors. And, and as you'll see through the talk, that, that's a, a problem here because we've come to rely on living donation, uh, and for good reason, um, especially for kidney transplant, but also for liver transplantation. And so the question is, <laughs> I'm asking you guys, what would you do? I mean, you did it. You know, what would you do if it was you and you needed a kidney, a liver, a heart, um, particularly a, a, a kidney or liver where I spend my time? I mean, you'd Google it, right? What did everybody do? <laughs> you Google the things you don't know about. So, um, you know, you live here. Uh, most of you, a lot of you, turns out live in New Jersey, but uh, you'd Google Trio Philadelphia and you would get 391,000 opportunities to, to look into it. Maybe you know Jim, so you'd Google Jim. Um, pretty impressive. You get 613,000 hits on Google. Um, maybe you realize that you, you're with Gift of Life, which is a great OPO. That's not bad. Eight million hits. But what if you just Googled a kidney or a liver for sale? You know, 35 million hits. Um, so there are people out there thinking, how do I get an organ? How do I get a transplant? I don't want to die. I don't want to stay on dialysis. And it's a reality that we, we don't have enough. Um, well, what if we did sell organs? What if we commodified organs? Um, very controversial uh, if we considered organs as a commodity. Um, but when you think about it, we already have a bunch of commodities, right? We, we buy and sell blood. We buy and sell sperm and eggs, uh, bone marrow. Uh, how about surrogate motherhood? Is there anything more dangerous than being pregnant? Um, pregnancy is actually really dangerous, yet we celebrate surrogate pregnancy, right? And we, people get paid you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 to be a surrogate mother. Um, somehow, though, the sale of the human body, um, you know, it really questions how we value human life. Um, it, it diminishes in some way human dignity it, um, to, to put the organs up for sale. And in some countries, it's, it's completely out of control. This is a, a picture that uh, comes from the Philippines where there's an entire village of guys who only have one kidney and big scar on their side because they were paid what we would consider a pittance, a couple hundred dollars for their kidneys, no pre-op medical care, no follow-up afterwards, and their kidneys were sold on the black market. I mean, around the world, this stuff really happens. Um, there is a black market in the United States. It doesn't look like this. Um, it's more about putting people together for, for money. Um, it's distasteful. Um, you know, part of the idea of commodification is informed consent. And one of the key aspects of ensuring dignity would be the need for informed consent, like we do for surrogate motherhood, buying and selling sperm and eggs. Um, and it's, it's a really important part of the process so that people make uh, their decisions in a free and conscientious manner. Um, you know, if I were gonna design a, a regulated system, uh, and, and this has been looked at. You know, obviously, it would need strict oversight. We would need people not to be taken advantage of. There would need to be some form of payment to somebody who is willing to give up one of their kidneys or part of their liver. Really, the, the volume would be for kidney donors. But payment doesn't necessarily have to be money. You don't have to give $50,000. It's actually been modeled how much an organ's worth in, in, in the fair market system. But payment could be a voucher to go to college. It could be lifetime health care. It could be things that people could really take advantage of um, and not necessarily money, which can potentially be, um, they could be taken advantage of by others. Um, 
we'd have to have a very clear system for how we give out the kidneys, um, much the way we do with deceased donors. There would need to be a list. It would need to be fair. We would need a full evaluation that people would have to, it would have to be safe for them, that they didn't have any underlying problems themselves, that they got truly informed consent. They would need long-term follow-up. It's not fair to just take the organs and then not follow them, make sure they're okay. And we need to treat the donor with dignity, and we need to appreciate the, the life-saving gift that they're making, just the same way that we do when somebody is a, a sperm or an egg donor, or a bone marrow donor, or, or, or becomes pregnant for someone else. Problem is, that's illegal. <laughs> that's against federal law. That can't exist today. In order to do this, or even to consider doing this, we would actually need to change federal regulation. We would need to change NOTA. And there actually is a group um, that, that I'm a little involved with um, looking into, is that possible to change NOTA? Um, because there is a rationale to, to do this. Um, so in the meantime, I'm a surgeon, so uh, I've looked at some of the surgical ways we can increase some of the, the organs. Um, because that's really all that's in my purview. Um, and this is not what we do. We don't just start cutting and see what happens. We try to make a plan and do it thoughtfully. Um, back in the day, they probably did do a lot of this. Um, and so we look at what is so-called marginal or expanded donors. And, and by that, um, we used to think that you could only take organs, any organ, from so-called perfect donors. So you couldn't take a, a, a liver from anybody over the age of 50, then 60. Turns out the liver is the only organ that regenerates and repairs itself. So we've used an 87-year-old liver, um, and others have used some 90-year-old livers. Um, the liver doesn't age the way our other organs do. And we've used um, kidneys from people that have hepatitis C. Um, we biopsy them. We make sure they're not damaged by the virus. We use um, all kinds of things, uh, people with um, high sodium, people with diabetes or high blood pressure. And same thing for hearts, for lungs, for intestines. Um, we've really expanded this so that the standard donor, which is loosely defined as under 55 years old with no comorbidities, that's just not the average donor. In fact, in New York and probably in Philadelphia, not so far off, the average donor age average is somewhere around 57. So most of our donors would be so-called marginal. And, and the organs don't have to be perfect. They just have to be good enough for you and, and good enough to last your life. Um, if we all waited for the 20-year-old donor, uh, that probably only represents 5% of the donors in the United States. We do far less transplants. So we, we push the limits. We keep pushing the limits. This is an example in kidney transplant where, and disclaimer, there's a little bit of gore in the talk, not too much. Um, some's cartoon. There are some real pictures. But uh, these are kidneys that are kept together on block means together with the blood supply that they come on from, from children, from babies, small kidneys. I mean, they can be literally looking like the size of Chicken McNuggets. Um, can we use those? Well, um, some groups have used kidneys together like that, and some people have even split those and used separate pediatric kidneys in two adults. Then you get two people transplanted instead of one. Um, the problem is that the literature says there's about an 80% chance that you would lose those kidneys. The blood vessels are so small, the technical aspects. Also, the, the kidney from a baby is used to being in a baby's body. When you put it in an adult, what happens when it sees a blood pressure three times the pressure that it was, it was used to seeing? It, it's a big deal. And if you look at using them separately versus using them together, there was a, a huge difference in success rates. Um, hyperfiltration means that the kidneys see way too much blood flow way too quickly. And then there was up to a 40% chance that the kidneys would clot off, that they wouldn't work, that the blood vessels would clot. And if you look at UNOS data at on-block kidneys, two baby kidneys together, the results were actually pretty good. People got a lot of people successfully transplanted. One, three, and five years, 85, 76, 70 percent. These are relatively good results at the time for using two kidneys into one person from babies that, that would have gone unused historically. Um, we, we put in place a variety of technical um, approaches and we actually, when I was in New Orleans, we split those kidneys from babies and we were able to transplant 87 people with it wasn't quite um, 45 donors, but we split kidneys. Some of the kidneys weren't usable. And we ended up with very comparable results. So some people won't even use 
the two baby kidneys together, we were able to use them separately and transplant a lot more people. And that's what we mean when we say, how can we push the limits? How can we use more organs? How can we get more people transplanted? We only had one thrombosis, so it was good. I mean, we, we had very good results, and, and that's been reproduced by others. And today, um, there are many programs that will now split pediatric <coughs> kidneys and get more people transplanted. And, and we have to do that. We have to continue to find ways to expand the pool, whether it's using pediatric kidneys, whether it's doing split liver transplants where we take a liver, take off a piece for a baby and give the, the bigger piece to an adult, domino transplants, I can't even believe it, Jim, you even know what that is, um, but a domino transplant for heart is, is really extreme. It's usually talked about in the context of liver transplant where uh, somebody has a liver disease that, uh, believe it or not, um, they need a liver transplant themselves, but their liver can be flipped and given to somebody else. Uh, it's a very rare indication. We just did it a week ago um, for a, a young girl who had an enzyme problem that isn't made in her liver, so she got a deceased donor liver, but it's made in the rest of the body's tissues so a normal person can get her liver and be okay. Really quite remarkable. Living donation, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, ABO incompatible, meaning crossing blood types. We can even cross blood types today in certain instances. Um, pumping organs, so lungs are being pumped now, livers are gonna be pumped. Um, pumping kidneys is very routine, meaning we take them out of the donor and put them on a machine and pump them. One, it allows them to be out of the body longer, but two, uh, we can start to treat the organs to see maybe if an organ that maybe we didn't think was usable can become usable. There's been a lot of success doing that for lung transplant. I suspect that in the next five years, you'll see a huge push forward in pumping for liver transplant. Um, so there are a lot of strategies we have to try and expand the pool. Um, this is an example of, of, of a transplant um, that we did. This is a, a child that uh, the drawings from a, a paper describing this and then we applied it. Um, the smallest piece you should be able to take from the liver is the piece on the right of the screen, which is the left side of the liver. Um, we actually cut that piece in half and we're able to use that small piece in a baby and, and the baby did great. So anytime we can figure out a way to use an organ more effectively. And then the right side can go to an adult. So now you get two people transplanted. Um, and that's really revolutionized pediatric liver transplant, by the way. Historically, there was very high incidence of death on the list. It was, it was good news, bad news. The good news was there weren't a lot of little kids who died and became organ donors. The bad news was there weren't a lot of kids who died and became organ donors. So if you needed a transplant, the children were really disadvantaged because there weren't enough organs. Um, Luckily, these techniques were developed. This was in Argentina, it was then brought to the United States. Uh, a lot of it was done in Japan. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But we learned techniques for how to cut the liver into very small pieces, preserving the blood supplies to be able to transplant children. Today, in the United States, it's very rare for a child to die waiting for a liver transplant because we're able to, to do so much of this. And then finally, um, there just aren't enough organs, even if we do all of that. Um, and, and every program is trying to push the limits. Every program is trying to get, use as many deceased donor organs as we can. Um, but even, even then, uh, we still direct our attention to living donation, which is a, a really tricky area, mostly because it starts with the Hippocratic Oath, right? You know, the physician must be able to tell the antecedents, know the present, foretell the future, and must mediate these things and have two special objects in, in view, namely to do good and to do no harm. By definition, living donation is inflicting some degree of harm on somebody who has no business being in the hospital, let alone having an operation. So this is a, a really tricky area. Um, and if you look at, at this data, this is UNOS data, this is over a 10-year period. There were 165,000 kidney transplants done and 40% were for living donors. So it's great that we were able to transplant so many people with living donors, but there were a death. And you know, we're talking about perfectly healthy people who don't need to be doing this, and 0.03% die giving a kidney. Well, um, you know, first remember that getting a deceased donor kidney is great. Um, it's great not to be on dialysis, but the average deceased donor kidney lasts for seven years. The average living donor kidney can last 20 years. So it's way better to get a living donor kidney medically and, and practically. You know, if you're, if you're 45 and get a kidney transplant that lasts for seven years, 
uh, you know, you're 52, uh, the second transplant is always harder than the first transplant for any organ. You get antibodies, the operations are harder. Um, you know, if you're 45 and get a kidney that lasts 20 years, now you're 65, you know, maybe that kidney can last even longer with the better drugs and maybe you only need one transplant. I mean, it's hard enough that one transplant, I don't have to tell you, um, but it's even more intimidating to think that, you know, if you're young and get a deceased donor kidney, you potentially will need multiple transplants, and we do multiple transplants. And, and this is the harsh reality. It's not that the Eagles won. That's a harsh reality, too. But, um, you know, the harsh reality is that we know that even when we put everything in place, um, most of the deaths in living donors are not technical mishaps. The vast majority are, are weird things, um, including anesthesia complication, you know, pulmonary embolism, a clot in the lungs, a, a weird infection. Um, but, and we have to live with that. So it's imperative that we do everything we can to try our best to ensure that living donation is as safe as possible. If you look at liver transplant, um, the numbers are smaller. It's kind of the same story. A 10-year period, 87,000 liver transplants, 5% were from living donors, but point two, seven people died during that time giving you know, a piece of their liver. If you want to put this in context, uh, what's the risk of dying if you're pregnant? This is just for anybody being pregnant, um, 0.02%. And the risk of being a truck driver, 0.03%. Uh, okay, when you look at it like that, it doesn't seem as, as intimidating. Um, when you look at it um, for liver, it's higher. Uh, and being a fisherman and a, and a, or a logger actually has a pretty high risk of death, three times you know, what it is for donating a kidney. But being a liver donor, 0.2, well, what's the big deal? Well, you're, you're still you're talking about perfectly healthy people that shouldn't be doing this at all. And that's a hard burden for the, obviously for the donor and their family, for the recipient of that potential organ and for the doctors involved in taking care of the person. Um, when we do living donation, this is where I spend a lot of my time personally is, is in liver living donation. Um, we have to look at a lot of things, how sick the person is. We can, for those of you familiar with how livers are given out, the MELD score, which is a severity score. We can look at the platelet count and how much portal hypertension they have. Um, we have to pay a lot of attention when we take a piece of the liver for how blood goes into the liver and how blood goes out of the liver. These things require um, very complex reconstructions. We, we can take the right side, we can take the left side, we can take the, the smaller piece. A lot of this depends on how big the recipient is, how sick the recipient is. Um, and we do this because we understand the anatomy of the liver, but there's no dotted line on the liver that says, cut here, this is 40%. Um, this, uh, you know, I have, I, I do the recipients, I have two partners who do the donors. These are master surgeons who spend all of their days, every day, operating on the liver, mostly taking out cancer, but they understand the anatomy um, in, incredibly well, and, and we have to because you have to divide the liver in a way that the person giving it has enough. And what's remarkable is when we start cutting the liver, it starts to regenerate. Within six weeks, 90% of it is grown back. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Um, and and uh, the stakes are high. This pop quiz, anybody know what this is? Nobody's up on their Greek mythology? <laughs> Prometheus stole fire from Zeus, gave it to man. What was his punishment? got chained to a rock where every day a big bird, a vulture, would come and eat out his liver in excruciating agony. And then at night, while the big bird rested, the liver would regenerate and the whole thing would start over again the next day. It's not quite that fast. But uh, even the ancient Greeks recognize that the liver has this magical property. And this is the basis on which we do living donation. We're able to do that. And, and today we do the donor operation through a, a, an incision this big in the middle. Um, we're able to stretch it out with big retractors. Um, we don't cut any muscles, and we just big enough to take the piece of liver out. It's really remarkable. The donors spend uh, three days in the hospital giving a piece of their liver, um, which is giving a kidney. They spend one day in the hospital. The next day, they usually go home, maybe the day after. Um, we have to understand the anatomy of the donor for the liver in order to split the liver. And uh, unfortunately for us, um, variabil variability for liver is not the exception. The liver has the most variable anatomy of any organ in the body. So variability is the rule. And uh, our group has published on this. We've spent a lot of time 
looking at the, the bile ducts in particular can be uh, highly variable. This looks crazy to you, but there are autopsy series um, showing all the different possible combinations of bile ducts people can have. And every time I see another one, uh, it's remarkable. It's probably been described somewhere in the world. But we have to understand that if we're going to take out half the liver and, and, and keep the person who gives it okay and the person who gets it has to be okay. So we spend a lot of time looking at the anatomy. The same thing is true for the blood supply. The liver is the only organ that has two blood supplies. It has uh, the portal vein, which brings liver from the intestines into the liver to get back to the heart, and it has an artery. So it has dual blood supply in and one blood supply out. But this is the complexity of living donation. This is a little bit of gore. I don't have a... Uh, the, the forceps are pointing to, this is a liver that's split in half uh, in a donor. Um, it's already split. Uh, the, the, the forceps are pointing to a vein that is bringing the blood out of that piece of liver that used to be connected to the other side. And we have to restore that. And we go to great lengths. We use pieces of veins, plastic tubing, whatever it takes in order, this is that piece in the recipient. And the same thing here, that's the donor. And you, you can see here, um, we have to use a piece of an artery from a, a, a recent deceased donor to reconstruct those veins. And this is that same piece of liver in the recipient. If we don't do that, the whole thing fails. So the, the, the point of this is the technical complexity for this is, is really at the extreme. Um, it's why there's not that much of this done in the United States. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you about that because it's kind of remarkable. What are the advantages of living donor liver transplant? Well, first of all, you get a perfect organ because we only take perfectly healthy people by definition. So um, brain death actually has a price to pay all organs, kidneys, hearts, livers. Um, the research shows that just the presence of brain death can create problems for those organs. Some of it's irreversible damage even. Um, so you don't have any preservation injury. There, you, you know, it's done in one operating room. We carry it out. They're out of the body for less than an hour, these organs, which makes them work even better. So there's minimal damage from that whole process. Um, you don't have to wait. If you have a donor, if you're lucky enough to have somebody who can pass the test and is willing, um, you don't have to wait for the liver. You can have the liver when you're not so sick that you're, you're, you're an extremist. You can get it when you want it. And it optimizes the timing of transplant. As you all know better than anyone, you know, when you get that phone call, you got to come in. And when the organ's out, it's got to go in. Um, that, you might not be feeling great. It might be 2 o'clock in the morning. For living donation, this is uh, you know, lady and gentleman surgery. This is you know, Tuesday morning, first case. Uh, we have two operating rooms. If one of the people don't feel well, we just cancel it. Um, and we just come back a couple weeks later and, and do it. So that's uh, really nice. Um, it also increases the global pool of organs. So not for nothing, anytime somebody gets a living donor organ transplant, somebody else who doesn't have a living donor maybe moves up the list just a little bit higher. Um, what are the disadvantages? Well, some are obvious, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a risk. There's a real risk of morbidity and, and even of death. Um, and the operations are much harder. The blood vessels are much smaller. The technical complexity is much smaller. Um, the bile duct complications are uh, five to 10 times as high as they are for doing a deceased donor liver transplant. Um, we can get something called small for size syndrome where we miscalculate and uh, it doesn't happen so much anymore, but historically we would take too small a piece and put it in a recipient, do a technically perfect operation and the patient would have liver failure. So we have to do a lot of calculations to understand how big of a piece do you need? Um, how much can you take from a donor so that they can regrow and so that the recipient can also regrow? And we turn down people if the sizes don't match up. We also don't really know what the impact of that six weeks of all the cellular machinery in the liver being turned on to regenerate that liver does. Does that have an effect on rejection? Does that have an effect on the recurrence of things like hepatitis C or of liver cancer, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma? M maybe, some of that is, is, uh, remains to be determined. Um, and also it's an extremely labor intensive program to be able to offer any type of living donor transplant. For, for kidneys, we need you know, two sets of surgeons. For livers, we need four surgeons, two on each side, and invariably, in a program like ours, we'll get uh, you know, a deceased donor the same day. Then what do you do? So you need a lot of people around. You need a lot of operating. You need real cooperation from the hospitals. Not every hospital um, can or wants to be involved in something like this. Um, so just a, a little summary of, of living donor liver transplant. Why, why do we do any of this? We do it because there's not enough. This is like the only thing you go into hoping you go out of business. 
you hope there are enough kidneys, enough livers, you don't have to take a totally healthy person, but there aren't, so that's why we do it. Um, we don't compromise in any way donor safety. Uh, there are separate teams for the kidney or liver donors that are completely independent from the recipient's surgeons and recipient hepatologists and nephrologists. So we, we make sure every I is dotted and T is crossed, um, even if it means that the recipient doesn't get a transplant, even if it means the recipient may die, we still can't cut corners because these are people who shouldn't be uh, having operations in the first place. Uh, we've gained a real appreciation, mostly the hard way, for how, how much variation there can be in the anatomy. Um, but as the indications for all the organ transplants have increased, so has the need. And so has the need for living donation. Today, um, in the world of kidney transplant, where there are over 30,000 done a year, half are done from living donors. You know, if you look in Asia, if you, where we learned how to do living donor liver transplant, why did we learn from the Japanese and the Chinese? The reason is, is because, because of societal beliefs and cultural beliefs about brain death, there's very little deceased donation in Japan, um, less than 5%. And so over 90% of the liver transplants there are done with living donors. Essentially, if you need a liver transplant, or a kidney transplant in Japan and China, it's got to come from a living donor. Usually it's a family member, they bring them, um, because there, until recently, incredibly little uh, belief societally in brain death, um, like the process we went through in the 60s. You know, if you look in the United States, it's the complete opposite. Only about 4% of liver transplants in the United States are done with living donors. Um, this is the reality. Um, and you can see we've done more deceased donors, but it's nowhere near. There are 25,000 people a year who are waiting for a liver transplant. So probably where the growth is going to be in liver transplant, um, fortunately and unfortunately, is going to be through living donation. And so finally, just a few thoughts or comments um, to round out a talk like this about what I think our responsibility is as physicians, as patients, as just members of society. You know, we have to remember what the basic tenets of medical ethics are when we start thinking about uh, potentially inflicting harm on totally healthy people. First of all, um, we have to respect autonomy. People have the, the right to decide. Um, and we have to make sure that the donors um, have that freedom, that this is a decision they're making on their own. Uh, beneficence, we, we want to do good things. I mean, it's, it's, a, a, um, it's a real miracle. Uh, you know, they say in, in, in Hebrew, it's a real mitzvah to, to save somebody else's life. Um, we want to cause no harm. We have to do this as, as safely as possible or, or, or not do it at all. And justice, we need to treat everyone equally. There are real safeguards in place for deceased and living donation to make sure that uh, we try to be fair and we try to be just. So you know, some, some thoughts uh, for, for me, these are just my, my personal thoughts about this. I, I think presumed consent might have some legs here. I, I think it would need to be at the, at the state level um, it would need a lot of education. Uh, we'd need a lot of hospital resources. Um, there is a rationale and maybe even a mechanism to do a demonstration project in the United States where we just took one area and, and declared that it would be presumed donation. That's complicated. It has to go through the Department of Justice. You actually literally have to change federal law to even be able to do a small um, trial project. I'm not convinced that this couldn't work in the United States, although there are plenty of smart people who think that maybe it couldn't. Um, it's one of those things I don't know if you'll know in, until you try. So we, we see a lot of people uh, who potentially could be organ donors who never are. Um, payment for organs, um, you, you know, commodification is, is uh, around the world in the, in the ethical circles that talk about this. Commodification has become a, a very dirty word because of what's gone on in other places around the world. I, I'm not so sure that we couldn't in the United States um, create a system that maintained you know, dignity and, and ensured informed consent. This would also need a revision to NOTA. Um, maybe it would be a little easier revision, believe it or not, than presumed consent in order to have a, a, a waiver um, where we, uh, my personal feeling is we shouldn't offer cash because that could be taken advantage of, but I like the idea of how about lifetime health care. You give a kidney, you get lifetime health care. Maybe there are plenty of people who are, are, are single parents who would like to give a kidney and, and ensure that their family has lifetime health care or ensure that their family has uh, college education. I could see a lot of ways that we could 
um, do this to have it make sense. We, we already permit it. Interestingly, you might ask, well, why is it legal to sell sperm and eggs if it's illegal to sell your kidney? Uh, and the answer is uh, a technical legal um, issue that um, technically um, sperm and eggs are considered by the law to be replenishable, um, but the kidney is not. Um, it's not exactly true because at some point in your life you stop making them, and it's not exactly true because the liver is replenishable, but it's against the law to buy or sell an organ. Um, as far as deceased donation goes, we have to keep pushing. Um, we have to make sure that every organ that can be used gets used. Way too many organs, sadly, in the United States get discarded. Some of them can be used. Um, it's, a, it's not malintent. It's, it's a variety of reasons. Um, not everybody's as comfortable using the so-called marginal donors or the baby kidneys or, or what have you. And we have to make sure that everybody has that comfort level or sends the organs somewhere that they do have the comfort level so they can all be used. And we have to continue to expand the criteria. We know that people with diabetes and high blood pressure could potentially have organs, hearts, kidneys, livers that are usable and some of our old criteria were very rigid and not really based in sound medical um, decision making. And living donation, um, look it's a special group, we got to treat them specially, uh, we can't take our eye off that ball. Um, that is where we try to push mostly because uh, we don't have a, as good organ donation in New York as places like Philadelphia. I, I, I wish we did, we, we try hard. Um, and there are a variety of reasons, some valid, some maybe not so valid, but um, one of the reasons why you find living donation more prevalent in places like New York and California is because there's an incredible uh, need that's disproportionate to the rest of the country for the organs and not as many donors. Um, and we need to change the social climate. This comes from education, from changing attitudes, especially in cities like, uh, in urban cities in, in, in New York. We have to really work hard to change the attitudes towards organization. And, and, we, and we have, and we, and we see it moving directionally correctly, but it still pales in comparison to, to the need. We also have to get rid of this whole DMV thing. I mean, it's absurd that you, uh, until recently, haven't been able to you know, roll online. I mean, it, you know, to show you the absurdity of New York, um, they passed a law five years ago that you can sign up electronically, but the state didn't have anybody, any money to pay the people to program the computer. So we recently got over that hump, raised some money and, and, and paid, but these are the kind of things that are just inexcusable for why organization isn't good in some places. Um, and we have to work towards a society where people see organization as a responsibility. Even if we don't have presumed consent, um, people should believe that they're invested enough in, in the care and the health and the well-being of their neighbor um, and, and want to donate. Um, and since all of us are potential organ donor recipients, as well as donors, everybody does have a stake in the system. And I think sometimes, you know, Americans lose sight of that. Um, so finally, last slide, you know, to be a little sobering about the whole topic <coughs> and put it in perspective, you know, in 2016, there were almost 7,000 people who died on the waiting list, all organs. Um, there have been 155,000 people since they started keeping this data in 1995 who died waiting, never got the opportunity, which boils down to somewhere around 17 people every day die who were waiting just because we didn't have enough organs for them. So I, I think that um, that's uh, sobering to people like us uh, who have had transplants and who do transplants and take care of a lot of people. You know, sadly, in New York, we do a lot of liver, we do a lot of transplants. Uh, we have more people die each quarter waiting for a liver than getting a liver, which is just absurd. Um, and that's it. So I hope that uh, this was helped some people. Uh, if it didn't, I apologize. You can cut it all out, Brad. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate you coming out on a, who comes out on a, on a, a weekday night to, to listen to somebody like me talk about this. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for taking the time. The question I have is, you had a listing of um, countries. Yeah. And I think, yeah. For presumed and informed consent. Yes. Yeah. And my, my question that I have is, do you, do they have more people who are surviving because of the technology and or the hospitals in those countries? Well, that's an interesting. So your question is, do the places that have presumed consent have more people surviving because they have presumed consent? Is that the, the gist? Mm, that's correct. Well, and, the, and presumed consent, 
along with the types of hospitals over there, that the uh, technology of the hospital. Oh. And all, the other part of your question is, technically, do they have better results because they're hos of their yes. hospitals? Um, this is what this you were is, referring to. Right there, yes. Yeah. So um, the answer is that um, they get a lot of people transplanted at an earlier stage in their disease because they have a lot more organ donors per capita than we have, uh, than anybody in the world. They have almost twice as many donors per capita, you know, 40 per million is a huge number of donors. But I, I think that the care in the United States is, is outstanding. I don't think that technically they do anything that we're not doing. I think if you can transplant people before they're really sick, you know, waiting for a heart, how long you have to wait for a heart in, in the United States is an intimidating number during which time a lot of people die. Same thing for a liver. For kidney, you don't die usually, usually, but you wait on the machine. I, I showed you some data that the, the results are completely correlated with how long you wait on that machine. In fact, in kidney transplant, if you get a kidney transplant preemptively, meaning before you start dialysis, but you're, you're bad enough to have kidney failure just before, that's the, that's the best. Those kidneys last the longest. Um, so I, I would venture to say that it makes sense that if you can get more donors, transplant people earlier in the course of their illness, they probably will do better. Uh, we know that from our work with living donors, because if you have a donor, you get it when you want it. Um, but I don't think that they do anything technically that's more advanced than we do. Um, although there are places in Europe that are pumping organs a little more um, aggressively than we are, and that's, that's the future here too. Now, one more question, if I may. Oh, in Spain, it looks as though they are right up there as number one. Do you see or is it your understanding or is it out there on indicating that they sell a lot of these organs? So your question is in Spain, which does very well with presumed consent, are they selling a lot of these organs? And the answer is that I think I can say safely in Spain does not recognize as having one of the bigger black markets. Okay. Um, and really around the world, it's abhorred. And um, the black market is shrinking, but there are places. Um, China has this population of very peaceful resistors called the Falun Gong, and they get put in prison for minor offenses. And we know that some of them are executed for their organs. And we know that in other places, um, the black market exists where maybe it's not as egregious as that, but you know, small communities in, um, in India and in, in the Philippines where people are not evaluated appropriately, compensated with anything that would be close to what you would think would be reasonable, and don't have follow-up, and, and have their kidneys taken. And um, they sent us from the United States over there, right? Well, we've had patients who have gone from here, and some of them tell us, some of them tell me, um, and I try to explain to them why it's a problem. I mean, look, there, there are some good examples. There are some places in India where you can pay, and you can get a very good kidney transplant. <laughs> and very responsible and they, and they do a good job. Um, but we've also had somebody get a kidney transplant in China, fly back through Los Angeles two months later, turn bright yellow, got hepatitis C from the donor because they didn't check and died. So, uh, you know, there's no regulations there. So anything goes when the whistle blows. But um, there are very, I think, very reasonable people I've taken care of that have gone. Nobody that I know of has gone and had a prisoner executed. Uh, that would be pretty hard to live with. Um, but the idea of going and paying for an organ isn't so foreign, but you got to do it safely. You got to do it somewhere respectable. But really, if that is going to go on, I think the onus is on the person getting the organ to make sure that the donor is compensated appropriately, taken care of appropriately. Um, that system doesn't exist formally anywhere. Okay, so you have it, sir. <coughs> you mentioned you quoted some mortality rates and how for a living liver donation, it's significantly higher than living kidney donation. Do you see those mortality rates significantly proving through introduction of new techniques, technologies, or is that pretty much where you know you expect it to, to stay? So I gotta do my part here. So your and question you, is, you yep. That, could you define how mortality rates are determined? Somebody dies two years later by hit by mm, a car. Good question. So your question is related to mortality rates for living donors. 
And uh, one part of the question is, how do we determine those mortality rates? And the other part of the question is, do we think that that's going to be static, or can we improve those rates so that not as many people will die? Uh, complicated questions uh, first. So forget the, the percentages. The risk of giving the right side of your liver, which is basically what an adult has to give, the bigger piece, 60%, is estimated to be 1 in 500. The risk of giving a kidney um, is estimated to be somewhere around 1 in 10,000. That's a death. Of course, the risk of having other problems are there too, infections and complications, but of dying, those are the numbers. I, I, dying, how? On yeah. the training table? Or no, training? that's any death. That's any death, but it gets, it gets a little complicated. That's within one year of, trans, uh, of donation. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, because you know, everybody's gonna die. So the fact that somebody gave an organ and died 20 years later isn't the issue, but yeah. um, so it does become a little complicated how you define your terms. Um, most people look at it as, as within the, the first year or something related to donation, um, or something related to donation. So, I mean, there have been donors that have had complications several years later that are clearly related to donation. Look, it's still a rare event, but when you're talking about living donors, you know, one in 10,000, ah, what's the big deal? It's not such a big deal, but it's a living donor. These are 10,000 healthy people who shouldn't have had anything. And, they sh and so that's the, that's the part of it that's, I mean, when you talk about the recipients, you know, the number of recipients who die, potential recipients who die is, is staggering. Um, we don't really, thousands, 7,000 people died in the United States waiting for an organ last year. Um, that's not as troubling <laughs> by any stretch because living donors aren't supposed to be doing this. You know, doctors aren't supposed to be inflicting anything that could potentially cause harm. And the harm may, is usually not in the operating room on the table. It's usually something later. Even been a couple of donors who have committed suicide. Um, was it related to donation? Mm, I don't know. Recovers from being a yeah. kidney donor. A week later, gets hit by a car and kills. Yeah. Are they part of the mortality? Because right. so your question is about how people get counted as donors if you get hit by a car later. Um, you have to read the fine print on how that data <laughs> is given to you. Yeah, and every single paper that's written on it, you gotta. I gotta read this fine print because these are important questions, right? If you get hit by a bus. Well, uh, you could think that's completely unrelated, but maybe it was. Um, it, it, you know, so, uh, these are hard issues. I mean, and, and the, the long-winded answer to your question is, uh, we are doing everything we can all the time to ensure the safety of the donors. Any time that there is a donor death anywhere in the world, we try to learn from it, make sure we're not doing that. So I, suicide's one because there was somebody who took Shantix. Well, I mean, you can watch TV and know that Shantix has a warning that it can, has suicide. The last person to be taking that is somebody who just recently gave an organ. So, you know, why that person was allowed to take the Shantix, I think they didn't ask. But now we educate everybody and don't take anything without talking to us. And there have been other rare complications. So we, we try so hard, but we know that no matter what we do, there will be some risk of death. But I, I think I would see that as going down, not up, because there's so much attention on this. You talked about pumping, yeah. and, and, and you know our, our familiarity with pumping is that it's a device which kind of simulates the organ being in, in a human body, which you can keep it going longer so that things like fatty liver, surgeon could actually do something on the liver to make it a better liver to actually deploy. And so my question is, is pumping is, are these devices, like what is preventing these devices from a more mm. expansive deployment? Is it a cost? Is it, you know, what, 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 what's going on? So there? your question is about pumping organs and how do we expand this? And I, I think the term is pumping, but yeah, I'm, my pumping. familiarity is this no, device pumping. that I right. mean, started in, in England and... Uh, right. So the most familiarity with pumping organs, and these are devices, is with kidneys. Um, many places, in New York, we pump essentially all deceased donor kidneys, meaning the kidney is taken out and put on a machine that puts cold preservation solution through the kidney and recirculates it. One, the kidneys can be kept out of the body longer. So instead of the traditional amount of time, we'll, we can even, we've had kidneys out of the body up to 50 hours, uh, which is really long. Um, there's a price to pay for that, by the way, but um, we routinely have kidneys that are out 25, 30 hours and don't see the same complications as we did when we didn't pump. Two, we can take, you know, Everybody knows that the, the perfect 20-year-old kidney with good numbers, that's a perfect kidney, but how about a 60-year-old kidney or a 70-year-old kidney that has a, some kidney numbers that are, is that a, are marginal, is that an okay kidney to use? We can put it on the pump and get more information. 
We can see how the kidney, the resistance to the flow is and what the flow is out of the kidney. And some of these are clues to how the kidney will work. So one of the things pumping has allowed us to do for kidneys is use more organs that we wouldn't have used and not use ones that sh we think won't have a good result. Um, that has been very successful around the world uh, and, and in the United States in particular. Um, pumping of a liver is actually, as you actually correctly pointed out, was really developed mostly in the UK, uh, although there are groups here now. So we want to take livers out. Maybe it is from a fatty a liver. Maybe it's some other problem with the liver. Put it on a machine and start to get more information. Is that a liver that would function? And also we could probably keep the organs out of the body longer. Now we could transport them. So a liver from California could come to New York. I don't know why it would. They have plenty of people waiting there. but. Livers could start to travel longer. We can start doing the operations at better times of the day, which is better for everybody, not just the surgeon has to stay up. I mean, we don't mind staying up, but it's better to have a fresh anesthesia team, you know, a patient that comes in fresh, the doctor's fresh. So all of that contributes to success. Um, we can pump lungs, and hearts are being pumped. So one of the other places that we're looking at this is for non-heart beating donors. We didn't talk about, but you know, the vast majority of deceased donation we're talking about is from people who are brain death. They meet these rather strict medical legal criteria for brain death and then they're taken to the operating room where their organs are removed while the heart is still beating. Um, we also have something called cardiac death or non-heart beating death where the patients have an unsurvivable injury but they don't meet the strict medical legal criteria for brain death and the family still want to gift the organs. We can withdraw the machines let the heart stop, they can be declared heart dead, cardiac dead, and then we can take their organs. But that's when the heart isn't pumping, and so there's a price to pay for that in terms of the organs. We believe that taking those organs and putting them on a machine will help us, even for hearts, believe it or not, they've used a heart from a non-heart beating donor and transplanted it by putting it on a machine, pumping it, resuscitating it, and it started working, it looked fine with the numbers they look at, and used it successfully. So I think pumping will expand the indication, will expand our ability to use those types of donors, and helps us um, weed out the ones that won't work. What's slowing down that process <laughs> with the other organs other than kids? Yeah, so what's slowing down um, the advancement of pumping? Um, this is a hot topic right now because there are a lot of FDA issues with devices and, and the legal issues. There's an expense. Uh, there are two types of liver machines, for example. Uh, one is um, using a cold solution. One is using blood, which is warm. Um, the one that uses blood, the cartridge for the machine right now costs $45,000. I mean, there's not many hospitals that can spend $45,000 on the cartridge for the machine that pumps it and still you know, make it a viable thing. The, the cartridge for a kidney, put in perspective, is $1,500. So we have to work on costs, we have to work on FDA approval. That's all going on right now, and pumping's coming here to Philadelphia. I mean, I already know, Philadelphia, Gift of Life's involved in one of the trials. Um, and so in the next five years, next three years, you'll see this for probably all organs. Lungs are being pumped fairly routinely on the East Coast. You gotta invite somebody else here for that talk. Uh, the, uh, I understand why it's <laughs> not good, but I keep getting a uh, question from the students. Could a person be a living liver donor multiple times? Well, that's a good question. So can somebody be a living liver donor more than once? Medically. And the answer is no. Okay. Um, technically, could you? Uh, the interesting thing about the liver is when we cut it in half and take the piece out, it does regenerate within six weeks, 90%. The last 10% takes a few months. It's called remodeling. Um, but the liver is not the same shape. It, it doesn't have the same blood vessels going to it, it would be essentially uh, near impossible. We won't offer it. I don't know of anybody who has offered that. I think it would be uh, beyond what's reasonable. And also, you know, living donation has to be about the donor. It, it, we also, our program, I'm not aware of any really, that will allow the donor to give part of their liver and the kidney. We just think it's too much. You know, give one, find somebody else to give the other. I mean, at a certain point, it falls in the category of just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Um, so the short answer is no, um, the liver is not the same shape and you, you can't divide it in the same way. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, when you were talking about the number of deaths each year, the number was about 7,000? That was for liver and kidney. There are about 7,000 people a, a year who die, who are on the waiting list. Right. So um, 
I don't know what this number is, but um, I know that people uh, get taken off the waiting list because they're either temporarily or permanently because they've got something wrong with them. And so uh, a lot of those people are going to die, I assume. So do you have any sense of what that number is? So your question is about people who get taken off the waiting list for causes other than death. Um, the, the data I gave you is removed from the list because they died. There are many people who are removed from the list for other reasons. Right. The most common ones are too sick for transplant, didn't want transplant, or somehow became medically ineligible for transplant. It uh, might be that uh, you know, your stress test, which was fine, now isn't okay, and your heart's not good enough to go through the transplant. It might be that you had a change of heart. You don't want one. It might be that, uh, hopefully it's not because of financial reasons. Usually we can overcome those. Um, we try not to let people fall off the list for that reason. Um, I think it's safe, although I haven't seen the data, it would be a safe bet <clears throat> that if you're put on a waiting list and come off for any reason, your chances of being alive are diminished. Right, right. Because you were put on the waiting list right. <laughs> with a, a real risk. So if you don't end up getting that <coughs> transplant, in the kidney world, they, they, the people who die, die of heart attacks and strokes because the risk on dialysis is so much higher. Right. In liver, you just end up with liver failure and heart, you, you get more heart attacks. Right, right, so, but, but, <clears throat> but the number of, of the deaths were the people that were on the list. So if you, if you add on these people who got taken off the list, oh, yeah. is there a number for that? Oh yeah, there's a number. So the question is, um, are there, is there data about the people who get taken off the list for reasons other than death? Yes, and it's publicly available. Right. If you go like I did yesterday, mm -hmm. and you go to uh, unos.org, and you click on the data button, you can go to center level data, state level data. I did national trends. Oh. And you can look up, um, you can put in the little box, uh, wait list removals right. by cause. Okay. And it'll show you by year, back to 1995, exactly why. And they have all different kinds of categories for that. And you mind if I ask you one other? No. So um, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of your talk. The, when you were talking about compensation for organs, uh, were you just talking about compensation for for, from uh, living donors? Oh. So good question. So your question is, um, the discussion about compensation, was this just in regard to living donors? Actually, what I was talking about was, but um, ironically, maybe you know this, Pennsylvania was um, very forward thinking years ago where um, Pennsylvania wanted to give a tax credit um, to donors. The governor signed the bill and it was going to go, in, I can't remember how much, I think it was $10,000 maybe. No, it was $300. It was three, I thought it was $10,000 tax no, credit. But, uh, but the Department of... For businesses who paid their... Yeah, or funeral expenses. Became, for, it had a number of living donors. Who became a, a living donor. No, no, there was, a, there, was a bill, there was a bill in Pennsylvania for deceased donation. And there have been two bills. One was in Pennsylvania. The other one, I think, was in Washington. I can't promise you. One was a tax credit. I think it was $10,000. This was for deceased donors, families who allowed their... Well, the one in Pennsylvania was for... $300. Okay, and there was another one for uh, paying for funeral expenses, but the Department of Justice stepped in and said it's a violation of NOTA. If you, if you put this into law, we're going we're gonna to come after you. Well, Pennsylvania had one where they paid a, a business, if they, a, a tax credit, and I don't remember the numbers, um, if, the, if the business continued to pay an employee their salary, if they were out X number of weeks for a living donation. I see and also as part of the tax credit, any additional money the business spent on temporary help. It wasn't used. They, <laughs> they did not renew it after the trial period. So, you know, the short piece of that is I personally would support finding a way to compensate, again, maybe not with cash, um, people and their, their families who donate deceased donor, maybe he's paying for funeral expenses or, or tax credit or an education voucher. But we have to be more creative uh, about getting people to the to donate. I have a question on pair exchanges for <laughs> kidneys. We hear a lot about it, but how frequent are pair exchanges for liver? Yeah. And how many people deep have you seen in your experience <laughs> for an ex a paired exchange? So your question is about paired exchanges, which are common in kidney, but you want to know a little bit about what goes on in the liver world. And maybe that's because you're really well read because your friends from uh, Penn just uh, penned a, a, a little article about this issue. Can this be the future for, uh, in, in the transplant literature from uh, Peter Apt and David Goldberg and those guys? Uh, you know, there's going to be some different feelings about this, um, and mine is probably just represents one side of this. Uh, 
it, it's going to be a very small number. They acknowledge that. I, I personally don't support this. I just think the stakes are too high for liver. And I'm, I'm a, we're one of the biggest living donor centers, so I'm totally pro-living donation. Um, there's a lot of complexity to paired exchange, which means you have a donor that doesn't fit you, either the blood type's wrong, the size is wrong, and John has one that doesn't fit him, so you swap your donors. Um, so if you play it out, um, you have to go first one day and get the liver from his donor, and then the next week he's going to go. But what happens if you have a bad outcome? And what happens if his donor decides not to give to you? Um, I, it's just, you're, it's really a stretch. It's hard to... Uh, I think this will be a, a teeny tiny drop. Look, only 5% of liver transplants are done from living donors in the first place, whereas 50% of kidneys are. Giving a kidney is certainly not nothing. The risk is far less. We, we do paired exchange kidney. We fly kidneys literally all over the country, California, Seattle, uh, Ohio. Uh, we get a kidney a week in from somewhere else through these exchanges, and they happen over weeks. And we've seen, we were part of the largest chain reported, the one that was on People Magazine. We were one of the ones in the middle there. Um, you know, it was like 60 people deep. That took like six months to complete the chain. Um, you know, also what we've learned the hard way is that the long, it sounds sexy, oh, we did 30 chains. The longer the chain, the more potential there is for the whole thing to fall apart. Somebody gets sick, somebody backs out, somebody has this, somebody has that. So our approach has been to try and enter small chains, two-way, through-way, done, get it done, get it done, get it done. And we end up doing more transplants that way than if we spent all that effort to organize 60 different people in 30 different states. Um, I, I don't think this is going to get a lot of traction in liver. So ideally it would come from a family member that was a match. Well, it doesn't have to be a family member. I, it has to be somebody, uh, and this is also controversial, um, we won't allow altruistic donors for liver. We do allow for kidney. You can walk up to our program and say, I want to give my kidney to somebody. Now you can't say I want to give my kidney to a black person. Um, we tell you, we don't, we don't play that way. Um, you can give it and our team decides totally above board. We go to the, like it was a deceased donor. We just go to the top of the list and start going down who's the right match and give it to them. If you start putting caveats on, you're out with us. Um, unless you say you want to give it to a child. We've, we've made an exception for that. If somebody says I want to give my kidney to a child, we'll do that. But you can't start in with the, the other stuff. Um, for liver, if you walk up and say, I want to give part of my liver, we won't, we won't allow you. Um, we just don't believe that that should be done altruistically, that the stakes are higher. Um, which is funny because then lay people say, yeah, but the liver grows back, so the risks are less, and the kidney doesn't, so that's a higher risk. I, I get that, but actually giving your liver, uh, having a, a liver resection is a, a way bigger deal surgically, medically, than, than giving part of your kidney. So I don't think, uh, but there are other people who want to explore altruistic and paired exchange liver, and they will, and there will be one-offs, but you're going to count them on one hand. Sandy, I don't want to take you down the wrong path, but uh, Gift of Life, for example, in their current numbers, say that they exceed Spain's numbers. And when we compare across the river, or the Hudson River there, New York is notorious for having low, recover, uh, low donation rates. Can you talk a little bit from your perspective about the OPO performance and its effect on donation? Well, Jim, I was ready for you. <laughs> okay. So Jim asked about OPO performance and why Gifts of Life, which has historically done incredibly well, possibly even better than Spain, um, does so well, yet just a short distance away, maybe the results aren't as good. So I only added one additional slide to this. Um, this was not the harsh reality that my talk was referring to, but this is a rather harsh reality of the world of transplant. So, Jim, you're asking me a question. I'm going to ask you a question. You probably know the answer to this, but maybe everybody else doesn't. Setting me up here, I can tell. <laughs> Absolutely. You know I can just escape and go down to the last slide, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost there. That's true. Or you could just delete it. Um, all right. So the question is, Jim, what is that? The OPO map? Yeah, that's it. OPO. Yeah, it's the OPO map. So this is a map of the 58 DSAs, the 58 OPOs in the United States. Um, nobody could draw this map with any purpose in mind, and of course it wasn't. It was based, um, you know, 30 or 40 years ago on hospital Medicare reimbursement rates from the government. This had nothing to do with organ donation. 
But at the time, this is what was used to set up the 58 OPOs. I mean, you can see that, you know, in the middle of California, you have an OPO here and you have an OPO here. And this has to do with how any organ is distributed or given out. Um, so why should we distribute an organ in that little circle differently than if you're outside that circle? And in Pennsylvania and New York, um, if there's a donor in Englewood Hospital, one mile from my house, which is five miles from Mount Sinai Hospital, if there's a donor in Englewood, New Jersey, at that hospital, brain dead donor right now, that donor is gonna be offered as far west as Pittsburgh, 300 miles. It'll probably get used in Philadelphia, 80 miles away, but it's not offered to the person who is waiting for an organ five miles away in New York City. So the map is, in Yiddish, Fakakta. It, this doesn't make sense. Englewood is right over the George Washington Bridge. It's in New Jersey, so it's part of region two. It's, it's yeah. part of your region. It's part of your region. Um, <coughs> And, and so there are, there, are, there are a lot of reasons why OPO, look, there are OPOs that have performed badly because the people perform badly. There's no question about that. But there are very legitimate reasons. Part of it has to do with how the map's drawn. Part of it has to do with what it really makes an OPO successful. What makes an OPO successful is if people die in the area that they cover in a way that they can be organ donors. So really, that's related to stroke rates and preventable firearm and automobile accident rate deaths. So if you look at Philadelphia and you Google the CDC website and you look at Philadelphia compared to New York City and you say, why is our OPO so great and yours is so bad, you will find out that the incidence of stroke is four times what it is in Philadelphia than it is in New York City. You'll find out that the incidence of preventable firearm deaths is 20 times what it is in New York City. You'll find out that New York has the fourth lowest stroke rate in the United States and you'll find out that um, it very much correlates with where and how people die, much more than it does in so-called OPO performance. No question whatsoever, gift to life, great OPO. We could all learn from some of their examples for how they support the community. And, and, but there really are practical differences of how people die that are much more related to OPO performance than just the simple, our OPO performs well, yours doesn't. Yes. is not covered by Gift of Life donor program. Right. The two Camden hospitals are right. the sharing network. So those organs are going to go to North Jersey. Um, well, they start first in North Jersey. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that's true. Um, the way the system works is the organs are first offered locally based on this map and then into the region, which is divided into, we're divided into 11 regions. So yes, I mean, that organ will never come to New York. It would come to Philadelphia first. Um, first, it'll go locally in in Newark, in, if they have a program, if they have a right. patient that can take it. But this is part of what the whole national argument is. I mean, it's actually, forget the liver argument, just the most simple one is kidney. Why should somebody who needs a kidney transplant in California wait 10 years and somebody with the same blood type, same demographic, same whatever, live in Florida and wait a year and a half? Kidney can get on an airplane, can fly any day of the week to California um, I personally, and we, this is how we met, you know, I don't understand that. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't support that thinking. I, my personal belief is that equal need should have equal opportunity. I, I get that we're all not equal, but when it comes to organ donation and the use of these precious resources that people donate, I don't understand these, these types of borders. I don't understand why, why this person has a different weight than this person. You know, in Texas, waiting for a liver, the difference in MELD score between Houston and Dallas is 13 points. Th that's, that's, that's the difference of, of probably 30% chance of life and death. How does that make any sense if the donor's, if the donor's at a hospital? So the donor, I, I, I think there, this, this, is not, this is not an easy, as Jim and, and anybody who's been involved in this issue for liver has learned the hard way, there's, there's no easy solution here. And it's not that every organ has to go to California or New York where there are more people. However, 
There should be a way to make a system that's just a little more equitable and fair. There shouldn't be any discussion about what the median MELD score is in a place. The median MELD score should be the same everywhere. There shouldn't be a question about how long you have to wait for a kidney or a heart in Philadelphia versus you know, Iowa. The weight should be the same everywhere. The organs are the, are the commodity that should move to where the people are, not based, certainly not based on this. I mean, you could come up, heart's done a better job, right? You have consensus circles. It makes some more sense. It makes, it, it's reproducible. It has a medical validity, right? You go 250 or 500 miles, and that's the circle around where the donor is. Uh, do the same thing in liver. Do the same thing in kidney. But, but we don't, and that's because of politics. It's probably why we'll never see gun control either. Um, it, 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 I was waiting for you. <laughs> Aren't they doing that already with regards to the area distribution for livers? Your question is, aren't they sharing yeah. Um, broadly? Yeah, a more wide range. Uh, well, in fairness, I, mean, I certainly represent one side of this discussion. Uh, in the UNOS board voted and made a step towards that direction. My opinion um, is that it's a de minimis step, which was just, an ex um, just a change. Didn't make enough of an impact. Um, yes, there is a genuine desire to change the system, but there's so much politics wrapped up in this, and why? Because ask the fox where to put the door on the hen house. You know, ask the guys in Texas where the livers should go. Ask the guy in New York where the livers should go. I mean, really, we have to evolve to a, a UNOS that isn't so reliant on the transplant community's uh, I impact. And this is what happened at the board. Great people like Jim Gleason, who are honorable and just and really went out of your way to figure out what were both sides of the story. What are you left with when you serve on a board if you're not the content expert? You have to say, I trust in the process. I trust in the system. I have to trust the content experts. Problem is, the context experts are all biased. The representation from the content expert is based on this. <laughs> you know, there are 11 regions. Um, region 9 is New York. It's New York and a little sliver of Vermont. You know, Region 5 looks like this. <laughs> um, I, I think we'll have to evolve um, over time. Uh, you know, in Lung, somebody sued. And in the New York Minute, not, um, it, you know, not just saying it, it actually was a New York patient that sued, but in the New York Minute, over a weekend, uh, UNOS recognized this was unwinnable, and they voluntarily changed the lung allocation system to something that made more sense like heart, 250-mile circle. Um, will that come to pass in liver? You know, I'm not a big fan of of thinking that the, the legal system's the way to do this, but um, it's only a matter of time. There's, there's, there, are, there are liver patients and kidney patients who want to sue. I think you're bringing out a good, strong <coughs> point, though. Uh, serving on the UNOS board, I certainly see both sides of these issues from a layman's standpoint, from a patient's standpoint, and represent the patient in those discussions. But the perspective of the legal system dictating how it should work doesn't make sense, and that's why you have these compromises happen, or they happen very quickly. We saw it here in Philadelphia back when the young girl yeah. uh, ended up in the courts, and yeah. I mean, I was totally amazed that I was right in the middle of it. I yeah. literally was coming across the bridge at Hub with all the news trucks down there. I thought, oh, something must be happening here. I got on the elevator, and there was a discussion about the fact that she just went in for surgery. What that's doing, though, it is forcing UNOS and the OPTN, the representation of, of the rules, to address these very issues that you're bringing out, Sandy. And that is, it shouldn't be by geography. It should be that everybody has equal chance. And it's one of those things that's so complex, so difficult, it goes on for a long, long time, as it has for livers and kidneys, et cetera. And all of a sudden, you have something like a suit being brought in the courts. You have a judge saying, by next Friday, you must tell me, or I'm going to do this. And so all of a sudden, emergency committee actions are taking place. And I've sat on those calls as members of the committee and also as a board member and listened to the discussions. And it's a compromise. And they say, all right, we're going to do this for now so that the legal system doesn't dictate how transplant is going to work. And then secondly, we'll review this over the next year and see if it's going to work or do we need to change it. And all of a sudden, something that's gone on for years is forced to be discussed at that level and something done about it. The other thing you should know is that um, 
transplant, this is one of the quirks of the system, transplant programs are under UNOS, which is under HRSA. The OPOs are under CMS. So you have different governing bodies with misalignment of goals. The transplant centers are told, you're going to be judged on the outcomes at one year. What's magic about one year? Why not 14 months? Why not 10 months? All right, they picked one year. You're going to be judged and your program is going to be certified or decertified, get insurance contracts based on one year survival. So what do you want to do if you're at a transplant program? You want to make sure that one year survival is good. The OPOs are told, you're going to be reimbursed and rewarded for how many organs you place. You place more organs, you're going to get more money, you're going to do better, you're going to get rewarded. You don't, we're going to decertify you. So what do you think the OPOs want to do? They want to place every single organ they can, but the centers can't really accept every single organ, so they have a complete misalignment of goals. That's part of the equation. So do you think that causes for wasting of organs? No question about it. That get recovered? No question about it. The data is clear on that. I mean, it, it's not publicized because it's, it would be overwhelming if you knew how many organs that were procured and were usable were discarded. And yeah. everybody in the transplant community, despite our different feelings on this, work hard to try and limit those discards. The system is clunky. When an organ becomes available in one region, it has to literally be offered to every patient in that region before it could leave that region. And we've made a, a, a career in places like New York using organs that others didn't think they could use. And, but we got to get that in a reasonable amount of time. If we get that too late, we can't use it. So these are, these are the, you know, this is the underbelly of transplant. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's the underbelly. You've been talking about uh, the, the numbers of transplants. Do you have any insight into uh, what percentages of you know, um, brain dead you know, potential donors oh. actually end up donating? Wow. And, you know, and, I and, do. and then what potential then are, are, are wasted? I, it's a great question. Brad's so going to get mad at me. Those, so, wasted no, no, I, I mean, right. and then not like, like no. Tom and I, you know, we, we talk to all these kids and, you know, we say, well, how do we measure if we're really making progress? And you look at, well, how many are registering to be organ donors in, in New Jersey? It's terrible. Terrible. So your question but about then if you look at, what is the at, potential? At, no, no, but then the, the stats that we hear, you know, from at least from sharing network, the, uh, yeah. uh, is that you know, at the moment of the decision, uh, uh, when the when, uh, next of kin is asked, do you want your loved yeah. one to be an organ donor, the, the number go, you know, doubles what the number is for people actually registered to be organ donors. So uh, that we hear it's about around 70%. So 90% of people have polled say they support organ donation. You know, only 25% sign up to be an organ donor. I mean, in some places it's better, in some places it's a little worse, but you know, somewhere, you know, only a fraction sign up. And the question is, you know, what's the potential? There have been many studies looking at Part of this depends on how you define potential organ donors. It's somebody on a ventilator, somebody not on a ventilator. But um, the short answer is a lot more are potential organ donors. Um, you know, there are also, because of this misalignment of OPOs and transplant centers, there are many OPOs around the country who will not go after a donor if the only organ they can give is a liver. So, you know, an 80-year-old donor, they won't pursue the declaration of brain death because the best they can do is get one organ and then they get dinged because they didn't do as many. You know, in New York, we've, we've accepted the ding for that. We get dinged on this all the time. We have the highest ding rate for, and we get criticized as being lowest organs per donor. Why? Because we go after every donor that can give, even just save just one life. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be something that is punished. That should be rewarded. Mm -hmm. And that's why, if you look, where have the most donors over the age of 70 been used in the United States? It's in New York. Second, California. It all starts to tell a story that's not as simple as good OPO, bad OPO. Although, no question, you can have OPOs like Gift of Life, which educate the community in a much better way, have, have embraced the hospitals in a different way. We, w things that we have not been able to overcome are the relationship between the OPOs and the hospital. Part of that's financial. It depends what they pay them. So there's a lot of complexity to this that is really the underbelly. And one of the fears of the transplant community has always been that if we expose too much of this, we'll ruin organ donation. If people hear that all this goes on, they won't want to donate at all. But that's where this whole thing with the court cases come up. If that's what it takes, I mean, it's kind of sad. It, it should be handled at a, at a, in a different way, at a different level, um, and we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. 
Go ahead, Susan. You mentioned that in, in our Belpiers region that we have a higher um, uh, stro stroke rate, for example. Even Howard Nathan says, unfortunately, we're benefiting from the opioid crisis. A hundred percent. Yeah, it'll, it'll, you know, everywhere in the country saw an increase. I mean, we're up, you know, nationally we're up big numbers in transplant the last yeah. two years, which is great. But a lot of that is from the opioid crisis. And, you know, here's another way that New York gets a bad rap. So New York was one of the first states to put into place the, allowing EMS to carry Narcan, which is the reversal so agent, and that. putting in place some early, look, we don't want people to overdose. Um, but we're actually seeing the decrease in the number of donors more dramatically early on because that was in place than maybe other places. I mean, this all tells a whole story and it shouldn't be, for me personally, it just shouldn't be about that. It should be that equal need has, it can't be perfectly equal and that's not what I would ask for. But I don't think you can wait 10 years in one place for a kidney and, and two years. I don't think you can get a liver transplant at a meld score of 40 in one place and, and at 22 walking in from home and other places. I think it has to be a better balance. And I, I think UNOS has the message because they're, they're establishing a committee called Geography Committee, which is specifically going to look at this for all organs. And they're going to get some more impetus because there are more lawsuits coming. Um, and they'll get some impetus to, to put that in place a lot quicker. Absolutely. Very smart people are not in agreement on these very complex issues, as you're getting some sense of. And the discussion goes on. The UNOS board, or the OPPN board, is 42 members sitting around a table like this, discussing these, having experts put forward proposals, which you can comment on through the public proposal <coughs> on the UNOS website, and coming up with a decision. Is it the right decision? In some cases, it's the best decision that could be made at that time in this place. And so over time, you're going to hear more of this stuff. Uh, you know, you're talking about the domino heart transplant. How would you know that? It was only two days ago. We saw it on Gray's Anatomy. We've been watching some past seasons. I mean, it's, it's every place. You get this information flow today. Well, that used to be a trick question if there's a lot. Right. Yeah. So. And, and so it's not as uncommon for people to run across this stuff just because of the entertainment value of what's going on. But it does give us all the opportunity to engage the public in conversations about organ donation. As bad as some of the shows are in terms of misrepresenting what's going on, it gets somebody saying, did you see? Yeah, that was entertaining, but it's not fact. And tonight, by coming out, you're learning more about those facts so that you can be the ambassadors for organ donation and sharing the success of transplantation out there, which raises the donation rates and gets people more of an incentive to say yes to organ donation. So Sandy, I thank you very much. And he's got a two hour drive going back uh, north to come down here tonight. And we certainly appreciate it. The audience that you're seeing here, this is our, our token audience, as I always say. Uh, the videos will be part of the TRIO Transplant Presentation cool. Library, so you'll be able to see them. And there, we're, we've got over 100 videos now. And they're up on the web, and we're doing more to promote those. So uh, in a week or so, I'll make sure you all get an email with the video uh, link for YouTube to see what we've seen tonight, in case you want to use it for somebody else. And for those people who couldn't make it tonight, they'll be able to see it. Jim, did you have yes, something you want to uh, say? Regarding our friend, Rich Ford, uh, if is it possible for us to spend a, a couple of quiet moments? Sure. Thank Rich you. was a very engaged member of our community, and many of us have close relationship with him, seen him uh, very active in so many different ways. So that's very appropriate, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy, I forgot to bring the book we give people as a thank you. I will ship it to you, okay. along with a couple copies of that children's book we were discussing Perfect. in our meet and greet nice. earlier, okay? Great. So that you thank can you. use it with some of your patients. Again, thank you yeah. for coming out. Oh, thank you all for taking the time.